why does God forbid the worship of images in the sanctuary? Um, he, 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 he or she puts in the sanctuary, um, but I think perhaps a broader question is, why does God forbid the worship of images, period, in the sanctuary, out of the sanctuary, in the life of the Christian? Why is the Lord uh, uh, prohibiting the worship of images, the making of images? Of course, mm -hmm. it's one of the commandments. Um, and um, so that's the, the, the first question. We've got two more. Uh, actually, we've got three more uh, questions that tag on to that. But... Um, we can wrestle with that. Of course, when you go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, um, you, you, you see the commandment that forbid. And maybe I'll just read that. Um, we assume everybody knows that because we're so familiar with the Ten Commandments. In fact, you know, I'm moving so fast. Let's have a word of prayer first, Pastor. Yeah. Then we'll go into the Word of God. Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you now for the privilege of spending these few minutes taking a look at these questions that have come in. Very good questions. I know that we'll have questions not only in this life, but in the life to come as well. Mm -hmm. But then we'll have an eternity to have Jesus be our teacher. We look forward to that day. Amen. So bless us today. Give us clear thinking. And uh, I trust that you will help us answer the questions that we have at hand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You Amen. know, CA, just, just to mention something. I have the exact text of the question that was asked. And uh, there's one thing that the person who asked the question wants to know. Uh, let me just read the question. I'd like to know more about what exactly idolatry is. Ah. God tells us not to worship images in Exodus 20, verse 4, and yet he commanded to make an image in Exodus 25, 17 to 22, which is the Ark of the Covenant, yes. and the serpent that was raised in the wilderness in Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. So how do you distinguish between those two? Yes, yes. I, I, I'm glad you, you, you read that. I, I, I have the, 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 the summary of the text. You have the actual words of the question. <laughs> um, some of it is answered, Pastor, in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Uh -huh. um, as we look at it, it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Now, in that first line, there's some information there. Don't make for yourself. Um, as we look at the Word of God, particularly in the erection of the tabernacle, the Lord commanded any number of images to be made and uh, um, uh, things to be done. But... That was done at the command of God for a specific reason that we will probably get into. But you shall not make for yourself. Don't you, of your own accord, fashion something that is supposed to represent something in heaven that you've never seen, that you've never heard of, that you've never laid eyes on. So what you can, the only thing you can do is invent something to represent something in heaven, which may or may not be a, 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 an accurate likeness of what's going on in heaven. But if the Lord asks you to do that, then there is a, a specific purpose. You recall that the children of Israel were, were enslaved for many, many years. When they came out, they were certainly not literate. When they went to worship, when they went to the tabernacle, they also were going to school. There were many things, the colors had meaning, the images had meaning, the materials had meaning, the kinds of wood that was used had meaning. The, uh, so there was always symbolism and teaching going along, along with the worship experience. And of course, if you're doing that for yourself, then you're not learning anything because you're inventing something out of your own mind. So there mm -hmm. was a purpose for images to be made, but it was done at the behest of God and not you yourself making something for your own worship. Yeah, and there's a very important point, just following up on that idea of not making for yourself. Mm -hmm. The things that are mentioned in this question, which is the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the two angels on the yes. sides of mm -hmm. the Ark. Full of images. And yes. also uh, the serpent that was raised in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Israel did not make those out of their own mind. Yes. God was the one who told them to do it. And actually the sanctuary, God gave them the pattern. Precisely. That's my so point. So they're not mm -hmm. making it for themselves. Exactly. God is revealing it, and yes. God is even yes. giving the dimensions mm -hmm. and what the things are supposed to be made of. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good point. When Israel made things for themselves, they automatically got into trouble. Uh, we look at the, the molten calf that was, was made. Uh, they got a little gun shy. Moses was up there too long, and uh, you got all this smoke and fire. There's nobody who can live through that, so let's make <laughs> something that we can worship. The Bible says they made this calf, 
and then they mm -hmm. rose up to play, is, is the term mm -hmm. that the old the uh, King James uses. Well, uh, there is this pattern that when you move into that kind of idolatry, you leave the pure worship of God. We see it over and over and over again, that there is this this pull, this predilection that we have as human beings to make things in our own image and then worship those things. And that's why the Bible says it's such a useless occupation to make something out of your own head and then bow down and worship something that you made for yourself. How real can that be? Mm -hmm. How can that help you in any, in any sense of the word? Yeah. And we need to continue reading the second commandment. Yes, yes. I, I because it, because yes. it not only says you shall not make for yourself mm -hmm. a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Mm -hmm. But then it says that you're not, the reason you're not supposed to make them is for the purpose of worship. Correct. It says you shall, uh, verse 5, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, mm -hmm. but showing mercy uh, to those, uh, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Yes. So, so it's making images with the intention the of, of making them objects of worship. Precisely. You know, you look at the Ark of the Covenant, uh, people weren't worshiping the uh, ch cherubim. Mm -hmm. the, when they bowed towards the Ark of the Covenant, they, they were actually worshiping the Shekinah yes. that came down that, upon mm -hmm. the Ark of the Covenant, mm -hmm. which represented the presence of God. Mm -hmm. So it's making images with the purpose of worship. A well, well, purpose of worship. The Bible does not waste language. The reason you pass a law, you should not spit on the sidewalk, is because you've got a problem with that. People are doing that, so you've got to pass mm -hmm. a law now. So if there is a, a statement that says, don't do this, don't worship, don't bow down, is because we have this tendency as a people to do it. In Numbers, the Lord says, you've got this fiery serpent problem, put a serpent on a pole and um, uh, look and live. That's all I do, look and live. So by the time we get to 2 Kings, uh, we're being told, tear it down. Chapter 18, verse 4. Precisely, 18.4, tear it down. Why? Because we've turned it into an object of worship. And that's what we tend to do. We tend to like to have something to pray to that we can see. And that's why God said, don't make images because you're, you're going to cheapen your vision, your concept of who I am by making this copy, this image of something that is not real, that you made with your own hands, which has no power. How can you make an image of an invisible God? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So, so you're going to make something in, in an image of what you know. Because you don't know what God looks You're like. You're going to create God in your own image. Precisely. Exactly. Rather than exactly. us being in God's image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, the serpent in the wilderness uh, was a symbol of uh, the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And nowhere are we told that God instructed the Israel to bow before it and yes. to worship it. Yes. They said, yes. look at it. Yes. and live. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jesus himself explained what it means to look at it. Mm -hmm. It means the Son of mm -hmm. Man is going to be raised up, yeah. and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Yes. You so know, two different things. If, 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 and as you look at the Bible, on, on the day that um, the ark was taken into captivity, Eli, Dad, Hophnon, Phinehas, Dad, you know, that horrible day, um, they took the ark into battle because they were using it as a talisman. They had adulterated the, mm -hmm. the, the use of even of the ark. It's just our nature to try to do things like that, to replace something that we can put our hands on uh, for the invisible God. So they took it in, expecting it to do some miraculous thing. It was never intended to be used for that purpose. And of course, they lost it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was taken in battle. Uh, Eli gets the news. He flips over back and dies. Hoffman and Finney. You know, it was just a horrible day, mm -hmm. a horrible day, because we adulterated something that God had meant to be pure and holy and worshipful, and we turned it into an amulet almost, mm -hmm. a talisman that it was never intended to be used for that purpose. It's worshiping the creation yes. instead of worshiping the creator. Very much so. Very objects much so. instead of a person. Mm -hmm. that, that's the key, objects. We, we, we like objects. Yep. And, and, and that's not what worship is, is all about. Okay, well, I think that we've dealt with this quite fully. Uh, so now we have another question, which is this one. I want to know why in Hebrews 10, 
12 through 14, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and, and is waiting according to that. So let's just read those verses uh, so that we can kind of uh, get our bearings here mm -hmm. as to what the question is all about. So it's Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 12 through 14. Um, Hebrews actually, chapter yep, 10. 10. 12 to 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, verse 13. From that time, waiting till his enemies are, excuse me, are made his footstool. Um, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So the, the, the question, the rest of the question is this. I'll go to the beginning. I want to know why in Hebrews 10, 12 through 14, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God and is waiting. According to our doctrine, that is the Adventist doctrine, Jesus is now in the sanctuary. Where is he? Is he sitting and waiting or is he ministering in the sanctuary? And, uh, and I think probably the confusion that uh, the person has that asks this question is, that in some places in the New Testament, Jesus is portrayed as sitting mm -hmm. and waiting. In other places, he is portrayed as standing yes. and interceding. Yes. So the person here says, what is he doing sitting if he's supposed to be in the sanctuary interceding <laughs> and standing? So, so how do we resolve that uh, yeah. a difference between Jesus sitting at the right hand of God now and Jesus standing ever to intercede for us? You know, as I looked at this, I, I found a number of, because, and both are correct, because he is standing and, and, and he is sitting, he, he's doing both. What is being emphasized here is function at that particular time. Uh, when Stephen was being stoned, he saw into heaven and saw Christ standing, standing. Uh, by, by God. Um, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, uh, it talks about Michael standing up. Um, there's a number of very interesting things, and I found some Greek words that that really all have the same root as, as respects Christ standing and Christ sitting. Um, the pattern that I see is that when Christ is about to reaffirm the covenant, when he is about to do something uh, that reaffirms his, his, his sacrifice for man, his, um, oh, what's the term I can use? to reaffirm what he's doing in man, for man, through man, he, he is, 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 is standing. Um, th there's, there are three words that I found, and, and not to get too couple, uh, uh, complicated and too uh, bogged down in the Greek, but um, all of them have this idea of acknowledging and confessing and reaffirming his everlasting covenant with mankind. Uh, his willingness and ability to deliver mankind out of trouble so that when mankind is being attacked, he stands and reaffirms uh, his, his desire, his power, his ability, his sovereignty over the affairs of man and his, his ability to deliver man out of, of that problem and out of those troubles mm -hmm. that uh, they are facing at that time. Yeah, in fact, uh, without intending to be sacrilegious, um, Jesus is able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Well said. You know, he has more than one function in heaven right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Bible tells us that he's king of the kingdom of grace. Yes. And kings sit on thrones. Yes, they do. At the, on the other hand, Jesus is, lives ever to intercede for us. Intercede. And the interceding priest stands before the Father. Yes. So I think that the issue is more an issue of function mm -hmm. rather than location. And function, yes. Uh, you yes. know, when he's standing, he's interceding. When he's sitting, until all of his enemies are placed under his feet, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus is exercising his, his position as king as of the king. kingdom of grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, they don't contradict each other. No. They actually complement each other. In, in fact, they're they are both... Uh, as I mentioned, they are both correct, uh, and and I like that chewing gum and doing that. Same. Because he 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 has more than one function. He's interceding, and there are times when when he is actively in the defensive position, 
taking care of when in, in Daniel, uh, when it talks about uh, uh, at that time, Michael shall stand up. Well, he's standing up to defend his people, mm -hmm. but he can defend his people at the same time while he's interceding for them and pleading his blood. So the sitting is a, a regal function. The standing is a, is a, is a, I don't want to say defensive, but he is looking out for the welfare of his people who are under attack uh, from the enemy. Uh, and uh, he can do both of those at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the king defends his people. He surely does. You know, that's one of his main functions. Yes. In fact, um, the covenant concept uh, is very interesting in Scripture. Uh, God is the one who makes the covenant. Mm -hmm. He's the great God. Yes. We enter into a covenant with him. Mm -hmm. And when we enter into a covenant with him, then whoever messes with up, us is messing with him. Precisely. And that's the aspect that you're mentioning from Jan Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Mm -hmm that the remnant at the end of time will have a covenant relationship with Jesus. Yes. And when the wicked come and try and destroy God's people, yeah. Jesus is going to say, hey, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. They're in a covenant with me. Not going to happen. I am the, their king. Precisely. And I have said that I'm going to protect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why it, it's so beautiful that, that Christ is your protector. He is your rear guard. Uh, Jesus, to use a modern colloquialism, has got your back. He's going to yeah. take care <laughs> of you. You know. <laughs> it's a, it's a good way of putting. <laughs> until he comes to take you home. So he, he can do more than one thing, and, and he's doing a multiplicity of things, including technically, and we say this technically, building mansions. So mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's a construction engineer also yeah. up there. He's, he's taking care of all that same time. You know, and uh, the fact is that if you look at the first half of the book of Revelation, in uh, the first three chapters, Jesus is walking among the candlesticks. Yes. In other words, he's walking throughout church history, mm -hmm. making sure that the light of the church never goes out. Yes, yes. And that was one of the functions of Aaron. Mm -hmm. Then in the series on the seals, he's the showbread. He's, he's feeding his people he's, he's feeding so people. that they don't starve to death. Mm -hmm. And in the trumpets, he's at the altar of incense, and he's uh, receiving the prayers of God's people. So, yes, so yes. He's, he multitasks. He multitasks. He doesn't have any problem <laughs> multitasking. <laughs> he's doing everything, Brother Pastor, that is necessary for our salvation. Every aspect of the salvation experience is being handled, being taken care of, uh, many of them simultaneously. Um, all we have to do is surrender and walk with him and obey him, and salvation is assured because Amen. Christ has done, is doing, it all. All we've got to do is trust and obey. Amen. Mm -hmm. I think we have uh, maybe six minutes to deal with the next question. Uh, the next question is this. In the Bible, there are passages that say that Jesus healed the demon possessed. What do I need to do if I am praying and a person is possessed by a demon while I'm praying? What can I do so that I am not possessed as well? So that, that's the question that the person is asking. <laughs> it's a scary thing to see someone who is demon-possessed. Yes, yes, yes. It's an awesome thing. It I is an awesome thing. When I was teaching theology in Columbia, one of the students became demon-possessed, and it ca caused a, just fear, uh, you know, in all the school. Yes. In fact, uh, a lot of the students who had, um, you know, pornographic magazines under the mattress. Yes, and they yes, had done, yes. You know, CDs with worldly music and everything. Mm -hmm. They made this great big bonfire in oh, the middle yes. of the campus and burned it all up <laughs> <laughs> because they were so scared. Mm, mm. <laughs> Years ago in Australia, uh, we were preaching, yeah, this is Australia, uh, uh, Warunga. Uh, a fella brought his daughter, who he said was demon-possessed, and uh, she looked and acted and sounded like someone possessed of the devil, and it was, it was frightening indeed. And a number of us were there, and um, uh, it, was a, it was a time she would not allow us to pray for her, mm -hmm. uh, and she would not allow us to touch her. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had this very low, gravelly voice. It was, it was quite, quite frightening. Um, what came to my mind? And I'll turn to Acts chapter 19 very quickly. <laughs> I got that in my notes, too. <laughs> you plagiarist. <laughs> <laughs> we are both plagiarizing from the word of God. <laughs> Acts 19, 15. You, of course, you're talking about the seven sons of Sceva. Yeah. Um, d d d rather than, we'll just refer to it because our time is going to get away from us. A couple of things, Pastor. One, Satan is not impressed with your position. 
this fellow was high priest, so he had a very exalted position. Obviously, Satan was not impressed with that. Mm -hmm. um, there is nothing about us that Satan is afraid of, that he's impressed with. He is impressed with the power of our boss. And if we are not in lockstep with Jesus Christ, there is no ability that we have innate to make the devil do anything, to cast the devil out of anything, or to do anything with the devil. He moves at the behest of Christ. We must call upon Christ, and we must know Christ for ourselves, which this, this particular text uh, points out very graphically. And there are people who make it their life mission to fight with demons. Mm. God has not called us to fight with demons, no. you know, on purpose. No. To go and say, oh, I'm an exorcist. I'm going to cast out these devils. Get out of him, you know, <laughs> and, and so on. Now, let me, let's just read this, uh, these verses in Acts okay. 19, because there might be someone here mm -hmm. uh, not who doesn't that. know that. Uh -huh. uh, it says then in verse 13 of Acts 19, then some of the itinerant, uh, some of the itinerant uh, Jews, Jewish exorcists, uh, you know, the King James, I, sense, I think, says vagabond. Yeah. <laughs> so these guys are going around. This is, their, yeah. this is like their vocation. They're itinerant their vocation. guys. They go yeah, around they're casting out about demons. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they say, I can cast out demons, you know. So it says, uh, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, mm -hmm. and Paul I know, but who are you? But who are you? <laughs> <laughs> then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Naked and wounded. So it's a very dangerous thing to presumptuously think yes. that you in yourself are yes. going to be able to cast out demons. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus is more powerful than all demons put together. Amen. But we need to make sure that we have a strong relationship with Jesus before we mess with the devil. Yes. They're trying to cast out Jesus, the devil, by a, a Jesus. They don't have a personal relationship with this. We're, we're saying, go out by mm -hmm. Pastor Boris Jesus. That's not going to help me. Mm -hmm. Pastor Boris Jesus is just Jesus enough to help Pastor Boris. Yeah. I got to get my own Jesus. And, <laughs> and, and the devil knows that. If, if I don't have Christ in me, there is nothing about me that Satan fears. That's right. Because we are just weak human beings. Precisely. But the devil's much smarter, much stronger, mm -hmm. much more powerful than we are. Yes. So if we don't have Jesus in our life, we can't mess with the devil. No, no, don't even try. And, and so I don't think you have to have any particular uh, facility. You just must be a, a Christian with a pre-existing condition. That pre-existing condition is you must be in lockstep with your Lord. You must be surrendered Amen. with the Lord. You must have the Lord in your life. Then you are prepared to fight the battles of the Lord. But if you don't know Jesus for yourself, you cannot hope to be victorious in the battle against Satan. Amen. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't believe we answered three <laughs> questions today. That's amazing. But anyway, time is up. Thank you so much for joining us in our program, I'd Like to Know. Please send us your questions to tv at sometv.org. Hope to see you next time. God bless.